in Ephesians chapter 5, we find some convicting scripture that calls us to purity. And that's what we're going to reflect on in this message. Would you pray with me as we begin? Father in heaven, we want pure hearts. We want to see you. And right now, we want to spend time with you. As we open your word, we trust that your Holy Spirit is present to convict us and lead us into truth and to help us walk closer with you by spending time with you in your word. We commit this time to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In the 1950s, you would have found Claire Patterson in a sterile laboratory counting lead isotopes in ancient rock. He was consumed with a project to calculate the age of the earth. And it was a lot of work to get that sterile laboratory. Many believe it was the first in the world and he had to be creative just to get the space to do his testing. He didn't start there though, that wasn't his intention. He was out in the field, but all his samples he took from the field, they were contaminated. They had elevated levels of lead and the method he was using for dating required him to accurately measure the levels of lead. So he got creative. He decided he would try to use a sample of a meteorite, believing that it wouldn't be contaminated, but when he got his results back, it too was contaminated just by being exposed to the air. So he was forced to move into a sterile laboratory to do his work because the very atmosphere we live in was too contaminated for him to get accurate results. Eventually, Patterson completed his project of calculating an age for the earth to his satisfaction. But the process raised some questions like, where did all that lead come from? Patterson believed he knew the answer. He also had an idea of just how dangerous it was and had convictions about what needed to be done moving forward. His efforts led to the Clean Air Act of 1970, meaning that every breath we breathe is benefited by the work of Claire Patterson. Claire Patterson was one of the most influential scientists of the 20th century, but many of us have never heard of his name, and there's a reason for that. Patterson spoke up about all that lead he found, and there were powerful people who didn't want his voice to be heard because he threatened an industry that made them very rich. If we go back to 1921, there's another scientist in another lab who made another important discovery involving lead. Thomas Midgley found that when tetraethyl lead was used as an additive in gasoline, it reduced the knocking in engines. There was a big market for that, and it was easy to produce. So on February 1, 1923, shortly after Midgley recovered from lead poisoning, the newly formed ethyl gas company made lead additives available to the public. The general public had an idea that lead was dangerous, but it was still used in many consumer products. It was in the paints we put on our walls. It was used to seal canned foods. It was put in pesticides that was sprayed on fruit. Water containers were lined with lead. Lead is a neurotoxin. And after 1923, it was puffing out the exhaust pipes of our cars. I first heard this story from Bill Bryson's book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. Bryson explains about lead that among the many symptoms associated with overexposure are blindness, insomnia, kidney failure, hearing loss, cancer, palsies, and convulsions. In its most acute form, it produces abrupt and terrifying hallucinations, disturbing to victims and onlookers alike which generally then give way to coma and death. You really don't want to get too much lead in your system. People started talking about some disturbing symptoms among the workers of the Ethyl Gas Company. Workers were dying. Others were becoming seriously ill. Naturally, the company wanted to keep this quiet. It's not good for business. You don't want your product to be seen as a poison. So Thomas Midgley held demonstrations to convince journalists and reporters that their product was harmless. He would pour 
the lead additives over his hands and put them in a beaker and breathe them for a minute at a time. And, and he would argue that he could do that day after day with no negative effects. Meanwhile, burning of leaded gasolines continued to contaminate our planet. Claire Patterson knew about it, but he needed proof. And he realized that ice core samples were one way to make his argument. In places like Greenland, you will find areas where you can see the ice preserved in annual layers. This allowed Patterson to look back in time through the ice to see what the lead levels were like in our atmosphere prior to 1923, when the ethyl gas company started producing lead additives for gasoline. And what he found is that there was virtually no lead in our atmosphere prior to 1923. It was studies like this that gained Patterson some powerful enemies that wanted to silence his voice. In 1986, the U.S. took leaded gasoline off the market. The lead levels in the blood of Americans fell by 80%, leaving us with only around 600 times the lead levels our bodies would have had before 1923. For over 60 years, leaded gases irreversibly contaminated our atmosphere. And why? Because for over 60 years, leaded gases made some people really rich. If we love the payoff enough, we will allow deadly toxins into our lives. Fill your spiritual tank with unleaded fuel. You see, a desire for the benefits of sin can silence the voice of the Holy Spirit, which exposes the danger of that sin. Ephesians chapter 5 invites us into the purity of unleaded spirituality, and it does it with commands like these. Be imitators of God. Walk in love. Walk as children of light. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, and be filled with the Spirit. The exhaust pipes of our spiritual lives should burn clean. This is not a call to fill your life with reduced lead fuel, but with unleaded fuel. Because sin is not one of those things that is good when done in moderation. Sin is sugar-coated death. Fill your spiritual tank with unleaded fuel. We're going to look at the text here to expose some of the toxic additives on the market. The text lists some of these toxic impurities, and some of them are common, but they're not safe. And others might be socially acceptable, but they are just as destructive. And they surround us. We don't have a sterile lab to go hide in and do our work. We are in a culture that has all these toxic, sinful practices. So check out some of these things on this list. Verse 3 begins the list with sexual immorality. This is a toxin that is responsible for so much of our brokenness. Maybe it's not something that has directly impacted you but a generation removed or two, it has brought brokenness into our lives. And maybe we ought to begin with just a basic definition of what sexual purity is. There's a great study in scripture you can do. The Bible is very diligent to tell us what is pure and impure. And we're not going to get into the full study, just a few sentences on this. But we find in scripture that purity is when sexuality is between a husband and wife, something designed by God to be enjoyed by a husband and wife. And when we stray from that purity that God lays out for us, we find all kinds of destructive, damaging situations. And so maybe you are someone who's tempted or who is struggling with purity in this area. And I want you to know, God wants you to know, you're not alone and God loves you, but you need to run. It's toxic. It will destroy your relationships with others and with God 
It will wound those who you love and who trust you. It is not something to mess with. Scripture tells us have nothing to do with this and fall on our knees and say, God, I need purity. And maybe this is an impurity that has touched your life not by your choice. You weren't making those impure decisions, but someone else was making them and they were hurting you. Or maybe they still are hurting you. And God wants you to know the same thing. You're not alone and God loves you. But letting those things stay in the dark is not going to help anyone. Scripture says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. Don't let those things stay in the dark. We need to bring these impurities, as difficult and sensitive as they are, we need to bring them to Jesus and find freedom. The next toxin on the list is all impurity. That kind of seems like a general one just for anything that's not clean, anything that's impure. And we could add to that list the impurities of pride and jealousy and anger. I think what it's trying to say is none of it's good. Don't tolerate any impurity. It's not right for someone who walks by the Holy Spirit in a relationship with God. It's toxic. The next one on the list is covetousness. So many of our wrong actions are motivated by covetousness. Covetousness is opposed to things like gratitude and contentment and faith. Rather than believing that our God will supply all of our needs, covetousness says that God has withheld some good things from me that I want and maybe that I deserve. And if you keep reading, the verse actually says that covetousness is idolatry. It's a dangerous thing to want the things that God has not made available to us. The next one on the list is in verse 4, and it says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. We try to deny the weight of our words by saying things like, I was just joking. But scripture is telling us this is out of place. This is a road to destruction. And as you look at these toxins, sexual immorality, all impurity, covetousness, foolish talk, and crude joking, how are you doing with purity in these areas? One of the ways, as I read through this text, that it occurs to me how infected our culture is with these things is to think what would happen to our economy if we were no longer allowed to use any of those things to make money. We're going through a time when we're all questioning what's going to happen with our economy. But imagine that things that were sold by sexual immorality and covetousness and crude joking and impurity, imagine that those things were taken off the market. You could no longer sell anything with a sensual picture. You could no longer get people's attention by trying to make them covet and want something that they don't need, that would hit the economy really hard. Industries would fall because our culture is so full of these types of toxins. And God is calling us to not let even a hint of those things come into our lives. If we're not convinced yet that those things are really toxic and deadly, look at verses 5 and 6. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. When we look at sin, we don't see a warning label that says side effects may include because death is not a side effect of sin. It is the direct effect of sin. The wages of sin are death. And it would be deceptive to say it may include because verse 5 says, you may be sure. And verse 6 urges us, let no one deceive you with empty words. That's what Thomas Midgley was doing when he was pouring the lead additives over his hands and putting them under his nose. 
and with empty words he was trying to persuade people that is harmless. And Satan is doing these demonstrations all over the place, trying to persuade people that the consequences of sin are really not all that bad. It's not that toxic and deadly, and the benefits are really pretty good. But those are empty words. Scripture says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Messages like this about sin and purity can be those messages that beat us up. And I don't want this to be a beat you up sermon, but a wake you up sermon. Verse 14 says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul's intention in writing this is not that people will feel beat up, but that they will wake up and they will look at the impurities all around us that are so common and acceptable in our culture and they'll say, that will destroy me. That is something I cannot have in my life. And I just have to add, just in case you're hearing this in the wrong way, this type of purity is not about earning anything from God. I'm encouraging us to have unleaded spirituality, to be pure, to to not let any of those toxins into the fuel that, that fills us with life. But that's not about earning things from God because God loved us while we were filthy in our sin. It's about being dependent on him because we don't want to stay polluted and contaminated by these things that destroy our lives. We want to live in the purity that God provides. Fill your spiritual tank with unleaded fuel. I would love to make this a conversation. I'm trying really hard to preach shorter sermons so that you have time to open the word for yourself and go deeper in the areas that you want to go deeper in. Call up a friend, get together with someone, and talk about this message. And to help you do that, I've put reflection questions on the sermon blog to guide you through this text and some of the things that we've looked at briefly so you can go deeper. Let's make this a conversation. I want to offer you an illustration that I hope can stay with you for a really long time. I would love that when we go to the gas pump, it would be an occasion for us to recommit our lives to God and to be filled with his pure spiritual fuel. So when you stand before the pump and you see the word unleaded, think purity. And as you take the gas hose in your hand, you put it in your car and your your tank's filling up, say a prayer that God would fill your spiritual tank with pure, unleaded fuel from heaven, with no toxins, no impurity, none of that, that he would purify your life. Now, if you drive a diesel, I'm not sure what you're going to do, but maybe you could look over at the unleaded sign and you could follow along with us. But you'll also notice that there's some options. You have different grades to select, but none of the options are for leaded fuel. They're all different options for unleaded fuel. Because when you stand before the gas pump of Jesus Christ, there's no options for impurity. It's all unleaded spirituality. So come before that spiritual fuel pump of Christ and lift the nozzle and select your grade and begin fueling. And you'll hear a message from God that says, thank you for coming. Please come again. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are holy You are perfect, and we are fully dependent on you. Lord, I pray that you would fill our spiritual tanks. We have such a need, and we pray for the pure Holy Spirit fuel to fill our lives. It is just impossible for me to know the spiritual condition of each one listening to this message, but you know it perfectly, and you care And I pray that you would just be present in whatever way each of us need. The anxieties we're experiencing, 
the difficulties we're facing, the joy in our life. Lord, we believe that you are our good shepherd, that you are with us, and we trust ourselves to you. We want to know you more. We want to go deeper. And we commit our lives to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.